This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Today on the show, I have Ed Sakota. Ed was famously first featured in the original Market Wizards book. He was also featured in my book, Trend Following. I consider Ed a friend and a mentor. He has educated me greatly over the years. I always welcome his wisdom. Today comes something a little different, though. Ed has a new book out called Govopoly. It's worth checking out. Our conversation today gets into a tiny bit of trend following, but it's mostly about his new book. And like anything Ed does, it's coming at it from a different perspective. I hope you enjoy. You're pretty well known um, for being a very successful trader. And you've now gone ahead and put a book together called Gavapoli that I think is going to surprise people. It's a little bit different. So what inspired you? What were you feeling that you decided to put this book together? Well, it doesn't exactly flow from uh, my work in the markets or trend following. My, my, my market work is all about trend following. And I have some deep concerns about our economy. And I wanted to share those. And as I say in the uh, introduction of my book, I've had those concerns for most of my life. And uh, I spent the last uh, probably four years now trying to clarify what it was that was going on in our economy and see how I could make some sense of it. And as it started coming together, I found myself writing this book, and then the book becomes an obsession, and then now it's done, and I'm... <laughs> And, and and I feel good about having it uh, behind me. But originally, the, the the motivation was I had a feeling. I had a feeling that just something wasn't right about the economy. Something just wasn't moving the right way. And I couldn't quite put my, my finger on what it was. And so I said, well, I need to think about this for a while. And I came up with a theory, and it seems to make sense. And I built computer models of it. And the computer models um, verify, at least the theory makes sense and explains the symptoms. So I, um, that's kind of how the book, that's the origin of the book, and doesn't exactly flow from the premise of why would someone who plays the markets want to write a book. Uh, I see them as fairly separate things. Let me jump into, you know, I'm, I'm holding your book right now, and uh, there's a very somber looking Ed Sakota on the front cover. And there's a lot of, if someone just picks it up, there's probably a lot of things when you're looking at the cover thinking, what are the meanings here? Where, where, where is Ed standing? And then on the back, the first word you see is the word assimilation, which is a very powerful word. Why don't you talk about the idea of assimilation and how you see that word in our society today? What's going on? What's being assimilated? The, uh, the premise of the, of the book and the model, which I call the assimilation model, has to do with the um, assimilation or takeover or absorption of the um, of the free competition uh, sector of our economy by what I call the uh, govopoly system. And uh, govopoly means monopoly by government sanction. And as the uh, economy matures, uh, the government becomes more powerful and forms alliances with the various groups to award them a monopoly status, and this prevents this prevents uh, free competition, and uh, eventually it stifles the economy. And this overall cycle is the that's the main cycle, and I'm talking about how that happens and how that comes about and um, the evolution of it. Assimilation means um, takeover or absorption. And if you look at the assimilation of the of the free competition sector by the Gavopoli system, that assimilation explains most of the things that are going on in our economy. Let me take a step back just for people that are new to this. And 
I think what's so interesting about your book is that you, you're not coming from a left perspective or a right perspective in, in terms of partisan politics. You're really just trying to explain what you're observing in the economy. But essentially, you're laying out a scenario that you see eventually at some stage of the game, the the assimilation of our economy by government, meaning government essentially runs, controls, owns everything to some degree. Is that really the thinking process? Well, it's not the it's not the government. Again, it's, it's not the government. It's the alliance uh, between the government and its ability to award award monopolies. And so you have the people on both sides of the political spectrum gain in the short run and, and receive benefits from the government, either protection from competition or out outright uh, awards. And there there doesn't there is no limit. To a, to a particular political party that can receive these kinds of benefits. So I, I don't have a, I don't have a political bias. This, this phenomenon transcends, transcends politics and it transcends the, um, uh, as you call it, left and right politics. It doesn't have to do, it doesn't have to do with politics. It doesn't have to do with who's to blame or anything like that. It has to do with the overall evolution over basically since since the mid 1800s till um, where we are today, and it shows what's what's happening and what's likely to happen from here. It doesn't have anything to do with partisan politics. Let me take a step back to something that you said initially that you've been having this feeling for a long time that there was something wrong, and I share that with you. And I was I was quite happy to see where you went with your book because I, I knew something was coming. I knew your new work was coming, but I didn't know where it was going. And so when I, I saw it, for me, it was frankly an aha moment. It was like, oh, this is, this is a way that I can understand this, this system that, that feels so uncomfortable and so wrong for me. But when did you first start having that deep in your gut feeling? Was this five years ago, 10 years ago, going back decades? When did you first start to know that there was this Gavapoli system was unfolding? I had, I had a sense that there was something that wasn't exactly right. Oh, when I first graduated from uh, college, I started thinking about it. And that's many, many decades ago. It wasn't until I started viewing it and saying, well, yeah, I don't like it. And it doesn't feel right. But, but the system itself has a logic of its own. The system is doing what it needs to do. And I stopped. I stopped trying to make the system wrong and stopped trying to blame people and said, well, what's really going on? How does the thing work? And when I started thinking that way, then the thing started getting clear to me. But the, the whole notion that there's somebody to blame and that it isn't doing what it's supposed to do, all those notions were interfering with my thinking. So once I, once I got around to, well, here's what it's doing. Let me try to understand what it's doing instead of, instead of, um, not liking it. Let's try to understand it. Growing up as a young man, you were heavily influenced by a professor at MIT named Jay Forrester. And I'm curious, how did Jay Forrester's work, his systems dynamics work, how did that influence you? And how has that played a role in, in for you understanding this system that you've been observing? Well, Forrester, um, Forrester, I think, is just an amazing, amazing person in many ways. He's uh, he uh, he's also responsible for, for uh, putting together one of the first working computers, and um, he had tremendous work in antenna positioning, uh, servo uh, dynamics, and also um, holds some basic patents on core memory back when they used to wind them out of magnets and so forth. He's a, a tremendously inventive guy. And uh, he had this notion of looking at things in terms of um, a system of interacting elements. This is a point of view, which is easy to, easy to talk about in a couple words. To fully get an idea of how, uh, how to analyze systems, um, this I wish there was a way, and, and so does Forrester, I wish there was a way to convey that in a couple of words, but the, the people that seem to really understand it, the people that come up through engineering and deal with the circuits, circuits designs, um, servo design, 
and, and see that if you if you if one thing changes, it changes everything else, and everything regulates and changes everything else. And so you have to view a system as a whole, <clears throat> as opposed to um, what's popular and prevalent today, which is viewing things as trigger models. I call them trigger models. You say, well, what's the cause? So uh, uh, there's this cause and effect mentality, and that guides our policy making. Our governmental policy making, and it guides our thinking. And trigger models just don't work. You identify the cause, you think that's the cause, and then it's not really the cause. It's just one of the events that, that sets it in motion. I use in, in the book. I use an example of a pendulum, where you you ask someone, "Well, how does a pendulum work?" They say, "Well, you have to you have to give it a good um, swing, and it'll just keep going." So we're talking about the, the the event that sets it off, but the whole dynamics of uh, how do you account for it going back and forth, and how do you account for the particular period it has, or the frequency of its oscillation, and what happens when you shorten the uh, shorten the string, or when you increase the mass of the bob on the end? Um, you have to understand the dynamics of how it works to, to come to terms with those issues. So um, Forrester had this notion that you could apply uh, system thinking from engineering uh, to solving business uh, problems and social, look at social systems the same way. And that was his uh, enormous contribution. And I was fortunate enough to be at um, MIT at the time he was active in uh, teaching these things, and it uh, changed my thinking enormously, as it has uh, countless other people. He's, he's, he's made an enormous contribution to uh, to thinking in general. Was you know just to interject? I mean, was the systems the systems dynamics thinking? This was this also led, and I'm, I'm not going to go there right now, but just this was part of your thinking as well for your trading career too. I mean, this his foundation, a lot of the things you learned with him were foundation for your whole life. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, enormously. Yeah. yeah. There's a, uh, the work I do with the trading tribe and the, the role playing in the psychology, uh, how, we, how we approach, how do you, how do you adjust uh, attitudes and so forth. We look at that in terms of a system. Everything I do is um, in terms of um, system thinking and uh, putting together some of my trading systems the same way. Um, uh, at the time that I started doing that, there weren't a whole lot of people doing it. I was one of the first that uh, started it, mostly because, because uh, digital uh, computation appears uh, just about that time. And I said, well, let's, let's, let's use computers to look at the markets and let's build systems and see how they work. So, yeah, I've, I've been very active in, um, uh, and interested in how systems operate. And same with, I've done some work on looking at um, fluid dynamics and how uh, how a lift works and airplane wings and found that there was some if you look at the system dynamics of lift, you find a lot of things in textbooks now that are, I believe, questionable. So I've been interested in looking at that, and the Bernoulli principle as well that way. So, yeah, every, everything I do is, um, everything, the whole thinking process is all based on systems. Let me go to the big, I think the big uh, issue that many people might have with your book I know you've known you for a long time. You're a good-natured guy. You're straightforward. You're honest. You're direct, though. And I think sometimes that straightforward, direct, honest, you know, people might say, well, I mean, for example, if you're talking about assimilation model, the Gavapoli system, and you're essentially saying that resisting this through elections and that kind of stuff really can't work. You know, people could step back and say, well, that's kind of somber. That's that's very uh, negative, perhaps. And I look at it the other way. I say, hold on. This is... This is actually enlightening. This is, this is, this actually makes me feel better because I can, I can, uh, I can wrap my arms around how this system works. So I think of many people, though, in America that are, that are used to uh, the, the 24 and seven news circuit are going to say to themselves, well, this is great. You know, Ed Sakota has written a book that, that, that says it can't be stopped. The assimilation can't be stopped. And he's got a model to show that, but people, I think most people in America just think, well, the next election can solve it. Can't we stop assimilation? Why can't we stop assimilation, Ed? 
Yeah, uh, you raise a good issue there, and I I do expect a wide variety of uh, responses. And I think that's certainly a response I expect is people to say, well, why can't we do something about it? Um, I might draw an analogy if someone learns they have terminal cancer in which cancer cells assimilate in the body, uh, healthy tissue in the body, and they say, well, why can't we stop it? Um, it's sad. And eventually they have to come to terms with it. And um, eventually it's all self-correcting anyway. I think it, 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 it finally corrects itself. But, um, yeah, my, my thesis in the book is that this moves forward. At this point, it has to move forward. And it has to, it's, it, it's in the process of delivering its own cure. And the, um, the whole political process is part of the way it works. So uh, I'm sure a lot of people would like to, would rather hear that. Oh, yeah. Well, here's here's the fix. And if you if you um, examine the bookshelves of all the books there on the economy and all of the there's, there's no end of books on the mess that we have in the economy, and most of them advocate a political solution. We ought to do this or we ought to do that. And uh, they've been saying that right along, and we know that doesn't work. But you certainly can get books that tell you, oh, if you vote for this guy or if you pass this law or you unpass the other law, um, it'll fix everything or set it back the way it was. But that's just not, there's no, there's no foundation for that. There's no foundation for that thinking. And I, I think that's how the system works. And I'm glad to have people disagree. I'm okay if people don't like it. Um, I think uh, hopefully this can um, serve as a as a as a point around which people can debate this issue. And I think that will be of some service. And some people want to debate it, and I'd, I'd certainly like to uh, promote that. Uh, some discussion of these ideas. If someone comes up with a model that's better than mine, I'd like to know about it. Uh, like to fix my model and reflect um, better information. I did the best job I could on this, and I expect someone will come along with a better idea sometime. In the meanwhile, um, I invite all kinds of um, opinion and uh, reaction, and I have a website where people can write in their opinion. I publish what they have to say, and whether or not uh, they agree with me, I, I think it's important to provide a forum for people to express their uh, their feelings and, and thinking about it. What I think is so interesting, and I've had quite a few guests on my podcast that share an overall uh, similar view about the economy and the issues that we have, but I, I notice, and you point this out as well, I notice that most everyone ends with this, they lay out this somber scenario, they say this is not, this doesn't look well, the system is is, is broken, so to speak. And at the very end, they go, but we can all rally together and fix it. We can all rally together. And, and I, it's, it's, it's almost, it almost feels like a dark comedy to me where it's like they, they, all these very bright people lay out a very strong scenario of why things are not going right in the economy. And they, we can all rally around and fix it. And I, I keep thinking to myself, well, when does that happen? And that was why when I saw your book, I was like, ah, okay, this, this gives people a place to hang a hook on, to think about this topic from a different vantage point. I think that's terribly important. Yeah, well, I'm glad you. I'm, I'm glad to have you pick up on that. Um, yeah, there there are things you can do. Uh, personally, there are things you can do to prepare yourself financially and psychologically, emotionally. Um, there are things you can do to prepare yourself locally. Um, I don't know of anything anyone can do politically. Um, all the political things uh, tend to make the system uh, go more towards assimilation. Everything political moves towards more assimilation until finally the thing self-corrects. So what you can do is come up with a plan to deal with what I believe is inevitable and uh, stop wasting time trying to figure out which political move makes more sense. So the uh, it, you know, I had a, a friend who um, very... A very bright guy, and he ran a ran one of the most um, uh, successful um, medical drug firms 
in the world, and he had a he had a brain tumor, and he got all of the you know all the king's horse horses and all the king's men, and he could afford anything, any amount of medical care, and he knew all of the brightest doctors in the world. I mean, he, if anybody could get medical care, he could get it. And there's nothing they could do to solve this tumor. That it was assimil- assimilating his brain. So, um, sometimes there's no, there's no way to set it back. It just goes forward. Time goes forward. And things, sometimes they assimilate and, and, and they take over. And that's the way they work. And I understand people don't like it. And it's probably a lot easier to sell books if you promise uh, some medication if you say well let's do this and it'll let's vote for this guy or that guy and it'll uh, or pass this law or unpass that law and things will get better and you promise you promise some salvation and those I call it, those books are medicinal they, they medicate your feelings and they maybe make you feel better but then they're not really laying it out how it is. I think what I try to do is say, well, here's what's going on. Here's a model that really explains it. This model explains the situation we're in, explains how we happen to be in this situation. And it shows that there's nothing in the system. The, the, the system that generate, generates a situation, there's nothing in the system that, that can move it backwards, move it, move it the other way. There is nothing there. If there were something in the system to move it back, it would be moving it back. But there's nothing there. And there's people complaining about it. Uh, yeah, that doesn't... And there's, there's, a, there's certainly an increase in popularity of um, media outlets, uh, radio, TV, and, and uh, Internet and magazines that complain about it and come up with all kinds of ideas for fixing it and they're ineffective but there's more and more of them because as we as we as we head into more and more pain there's more and more need for this medication more and more people want to think what can we do about it my claim is that it's doing what it's supposed to do the system is already working it already works this is just people don't like what it does but this is how it works this is how it works so that's the message of the book. Here's how it works. And it doesn't pretend that it works differently than it does. And it doesn't pretend that if you go out and complain about it, anything is going to change. I think the, the model there is you, you, there's lots of examples in nature of assimilation and um, a predatory behavior uh, in the animal kingdom, all kinds of animals uh, invade other animals and um, consume them and uh, it's a very natural process you have you know in childbirth you have a you have an organism living inside of its mother and it's basically consuming its mother now in that case the the child actually emerges and then stops stops consuming the, the mother's body and Maybe maybe consumes her in other ways, but that's a different kind of a, a different kind of a parasite. That's one where, by by design, it discharges and separates itself from the host. What we have here uh, in the assimilation model of the economy, we don't have that kind of a, that kind of assimilation. The government does not, by design, intend to separate itself from the host and let, let the host alone. It, it doesn't work that way. This is more like. Um, cancer that metastasizes in the body that appears everywhere and there's no way to get rid of it and and there's no clinic there's no clinic you can go to to remove it so it, it if you look at the overall system this is what it's supposed to do this is how it works and if you look at it as a system this is what the system does this is how it's supposed to operate this is how it operates and that's that and then you can have your feelings about it and I suppose my guess is the reaction to my book, which I expect about 90% people expressing feelings about it. I've had a lot of that. And a few people actually address the issue, like what you're doing. You seem to be open to addressing the issues. So um, I'm delighted to have, a, have someone interested in what the book actually says. And uh, I also expect... Um, 
it's it's likely to uh, excite a lot of feelings because people there's well, something about it that uh, it brings up all of the feelings about what they don't like. But I've, I've, and for that purpose too, I was trying to stay very apolitical about it and not and not further go down the line of polarizing people. I'm just looking at the system. And, and, I'm, and I'm not wanting to polarize this in terms of who's right and who's wrong and whose policies. And that, because if you look at the evolution, uh, every administration and every every a group of people all start out idealistic, and then they wind up being absorbed and assimilated into the system too. So it's not you, know, you have you have this and this champion, and they say, "Well, we're going to fix the system," and then they get into the they get into the actual. How does the system work? And they can't get they can't get they can't get their agenda to work. And some of them move over to the other side, and that's that's how the system works. You know, Ed, you you bring up another issue as we move towards assimilation, as you describe in your book. You you attach a wrinkle as we move towards assimilation, and the wrinkle, as I see it, and it's it's clearly evidenced with a unique picture on the front cover of your book, is the exponential growth the exponential curve that assimilation takes. Because I think if people dig into your work and they start to follow this, they might they might think in the typical way maybe that human beings like to think, which is kind of a, a linear progression. But the way that you see this, the way you see the assimilation model unfolding is that at some stage of the game, there's going to be an exponential growth rate in the assimilation model in term, as it moves towards the, the takeover, so to speak. Um, why don't you explain that? And maybe even talk about duckweed and how you made the analogy to explain this, this exponential process. I think this is very difficult for people to, to maybe accept and even understand. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for bringing up that, that issue. That's another, uh, that's probably the other major point of the book, is that this process of assimilation um, has an exponential characteristic. It's exponential. That means it has a doubling time. Uh, and things that things that double they tend to when they're small and that's why I use duckweed you have a duck I, I chose duckweed because that's one of the fastest growing uh, plants that some of species can double in a day or two so if you if there's only a few duckweed in your pond you don't care but when it gets to the point where you notice it it's already too late to do anything about it. So, uh, then the same way with any process, the same thing with, uh, a cancer. There's, there's certainly a lot of wisdom behind the idea of check often and get it while it's, not get it early. If you wait, if you wait until you notice it and it starts to cause symptoms, it's too late to deal with it. So, um, this is the nature of of exponential growth. It's probably one of the least well understood mathematical principles and the most important one how exponentials work and they 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 work so that you don't notice them until until they become important. And when they become important, then it's too late to do anything about it. So it's, and in your language, the way you phrase this, you say, well, things are getting exponential now. Well, it's not exactly accurate. They've been exponential all along. They're just getting noticeable now. So something that's really small, you have a penny, and it doubles, well, great, you got two pennies. So that's probably not going to do much to your net worth. And then you have four, and then you have eight, and 16, and so forth. You don't notice it, but to the point where maybe you have a million dollars, and then you have two million, and then whatever, you start to notice it. So um, by the time you notice it, it becomes important. In this case, um, it's important to notice that this is now um this is now to the point where we have the last phases where the where the Gavopoli system is now assimilating the um, free competition sector at a rate which is enormous, and we have now the um, the lowest percentage of people um, with jobs. 
uh, that is the number of people divide, the number of people in, in jobs divided by the number of people uh, without without the advantage of all of the, the mathematics about who's available and so forth but the actual employment number of people in jobs divided by the total number of people that's at an all-time low for the last 30 or 40 years manufacturing is down um, you've got personal freedom down you've got all of these symptoms showing up now and we're now noticing them and at the point we're noticing them it's way too late to do anything about them because the, the process itself has now grown to the point where it's, where it's um, important and execrable and it can't be stopped it has to stop itself and so we can eventually we we're, I think we're, we're going to get um, increasingly volatile markets bubbles we're going to have a Long-term trend towards lower, <clears throat> lower standard of living. That'll show up as um, higher debt and eventually inflation. Huge dependency on a government. We have more class warfare. A lot of waste, loss of personal freedom. All of these, all of these symptoms that people want to address the symptoms um, are part of a system which is larger and explains all of these factors and. And the, the system has been growing along for a hundred years exponentially. It's been, it's been, it's been growing, but now we start to notice it. Because now we're, now someone you know, someone you know lost their job. Um, someone you know had to close his business or went out of business. And so it's getting personal and it's getting close. To people, it's been going on, but it's been it's been it's been small. But as it grows and it grows exponentially, and then on the cover of my book, I have myself standing in a pond of duckweed. That's my that's my, one of my main metaphors. Is how does duckweed grow? And there I am playing with my banjo in duckweed. And my part of my conclusion is, you might as well do what you like to do. And just accept the fact that the duckweed is here. It's here to stay, and it's going to be here to stay until it kills everything else in the pond. That's what duckweed does. It essentially smothers everything else in the pond, and that releases additional nitrogen that the duckweed likes. But I really picture me playing my banjo in the duckweed, so I just accept it. You don't see me trying to do anything to... Uh, you don't see me doing anything to try to eliminate the duckweed. I'm just out there doing what I need to do, which is playing my banjo. Well, and I think this is this is where this is where your point of view will probably cause some people um, some discomfort because you're saying that the typical ways that many people in society want to address these problems that you see, you're pointing out, hey, this this hasn't worked. It's moving towards assimilation. And that's going to cause many people who have entire lives and careers built around providing this medicine, either political medicine or, or actual medicine, whatever. But uh, many people are going to feel threatened by a, a model that says, hey, we really – the model is in place. It's moving forward. We can't stop it. We can't control it. It's going to do what this particular model wants to do. And that's – that's going to be uh, alarming for some people. This is not a message, and you know this, Ed. This is not a message that that is out there in other books. It's not in mainstream media at all. No, it's not. Um, yeah, I had trouble um, getting main <laughs> getting mainstream media interested in uh, this project. <laughs> this project, uh, which I wasn't surprised. I, I think you're you're correct, and I I think you're correct. It's going to alarm and irritate people. And I see that as a, um, I see that as a, a benefit. If if people can develop a se a sense of unease and irritation that something isn't right and there's nothing they can do to fix the system, then they can divert their attention to something meaningful and worthwhile, which is to align themselves so that so that they're going with assimilation instead of against it. And yeah, a lot of people. I, I project a lot of people um, uh, may find themselves in a deteriorating situation in their quality of life without work or uh, suddenly without work. 
And um, if they can get irritated to think about this before it happens, maybe they can prepare themselves a little bit for um, for what's happening or what's on the way. I, I don't, you know, it, 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 it would be, it, it, it would be, I suppose, some fantasy to think, well, okay, everybody's going to get the book, everybody's going to read it, everybody's going to see how the system does work, and everybody's going to get together and change the system. But I don't think that's realistic either. I think a few people may catch on and see, well, this is how it works, and maybe they'll agree with me. Maybe they won't. But I don't think that I don't think that changes the system. So I think, yeah, you're you're right. People are going to look at this, and it's this is not a medicinal book. This doesn't leave you feeling like um, there's a policy we can change to fix it, and it doesn't it doesn't do the distraction thing. You gotta you gotta get on the the right side or the left side or the blue side or the green side or the red side, and let's take up the banner of our group and let's march into our let's march into battle and set things straight. I think that's medicinal too. It, it gives people a distraction. You you get them on a team to fight something that they can't win anyway. But I don't I don't do that. I don't exhort people to fight or do anything. I say just here's what's going on. Here's what I think you can expect to happen. And if you agree with this, there are things you can do personally to prepare yourself. And I think part of that process, part of that dynamic would be an awareness that, whoa, this is, this is major and it's imminent. And that's, I think that's likely an uncomfortable feeling. So I, I think one of the ways that the book can serve people is by making them uncomfortable. I'm, I'm not going the other way. I know you can sell more books by promising some salvation and making them feel good, but that's not what I'm doing here. So I'm just, I have no idea how the book is going to run. <laughs> some people like it. Some people don't. But I'm, it's not medicinal. I'm not promising a solution. And purposely so. And I think the the very thing you point out, it's likely to irritate people. I say, well, great. Then I've, <laughs> I've accomplished my mission. Well, I, I, I think, that's selling yourself a little short. I think your mission is bigger than that. And for someone like myself, and there's many other people like me, I read it and I, I actually walked away feeling good. And I mean, I walked away feeling like, oh, wow, I've got a place, I've got a way in my mind to look at society and look at what I'm in the middle of, you know, growing up in the, you know, my formative years in the 90s and the 2000s here. And I can I can kind of make sense of this all. And what's so nice, and I think we maybe we can shift there because I don't want people to think this is all somber, is that you say to people, hey, go enjoy life. Do something fun. I don't paint a picture, learn the banjo, trade, do, you know, enjoy life, but just don't spend an infinite amount of time, you know, glued to the cable news shows or debating politics or this or that, because the system is going to do what it's going to do. And so for me, I love that message because then it's just like, hey, you're, you're right. Let's, you know, we've got limited time on this planet. Let's go enjoy ourselves. I mean, am I, I'm barking up the right tree, aren't I, Ed? Well, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you got to that point with it. You got through the irritation, and you went through to the the personal resolution. And here's what here's what I can do um, as a person to cope with it. So I'm that that's the ideal. Uh, that's the ideal is to do what um, uh, go with what you feel in your heart, and you're happy anyway. That's what makes people happy is when they uh, they find something they can do and they share it with other people. Um, that's about as good as it gets, and it's. I think you always want to do that, but especially now, if people can just find that whatever it is inside them that they, they want to express and find a way to express it, that's how the new that's how the new society is going to have to form anyway. You might as well start practicing people that make it through what, whatever is going to happen. How are this how are this thing is going to uh, fall apart and reform? It will reform around people who are doing something they like doing that's of service to others. And that's eventually, it, eventually we wind up with a solution because um, the system 
has to fall apart. There's no way you can um, basically replace work with printing money. You can't do that, although <laughs> we're running that experiment again to prove it. So, yeah, I, I think if you can get to that point where just find something you like to do. I'm Personally, I'm spending much more time now playing banjo. I'm starting a band, and I'm out playing maybe uh, you know, three four times a week. I just decide that's one of the things I like to do. Uh, as you say, it's more... <laughs> More fun doing that and watching the news. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Because so, I'm my my um, my 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 solution to it is right on the cover of the book. You don't really have to read the book; you can just look at the cover. That's pretty much the. <laughs> we got is duckweed everywhere. It's smothering the pond. So, so do what you want to do. In my case, um, I just would have voted for Ed smiling on the cover instead. Ed in the duckweed smiling playing the banjo, right? Well, yeah, that, there was uh, there was a lot of uh, there was actually a lot of discussion about that, and I was I was looking for the the smiley thing too. I thought that would work, but I I have I had experts, photographers, and so forth. And I had a, I had a panel of people who helped me pick the picture, and we had some that were smiley, and they said it's not the best look, uh. and so. Um, I said, okay, but just let's go with that. And uh, so, I, I, of course, I authorized the picture. I, it was my choice. I, I listened to, I listened to people, and they thought that the, the well, the they'll, they'll hear your, they'll hear your smile on the podcast interview. So, <laughs> well, yeah, they have to. <laughs> well, there's there's plenty of you know there's plenty of pictures inside to uh, uh, to hopefully to elicit smiles. Yeah, no, you're, you're good natured about it, very much so. Hey, let me, I've got a, cu- a, a couple more things I want to address with you. But, you know, one thing I think people could, some critics could probably say, you know, well, Ed, this is very uh, alarmist or this is, you know, well off into the future. Of course, you address that by discussing exponential. But, you know, I, I saw a show recently on CNN and it was Anthony Bourdain's uh, new travel show on CNN. And he was in Detroit and the entire episode was basically like going through the ruins of Detroit, this entire failed city. So now now the critics could say, well, that's just Detroit. But it's also very alarming that one of a major American city has become a, a ghost town, a, a, a fallen Rome. And so, it, you know, people could say, hey, this is alarmist. But then if you look at the facts, the facts say, here's a great example. Look at Detroit. Uh, that, that's the experience of the whole country. <laughs> Detroit's a little ahead of the curve. When I mean, that the same policies there, uh, the same policies there that account for the demise of Detroit are the ones that were same policies we didn't run the country. So that's a that's a really good uh, a precursor of uh, you know, as we assimilate all the assets of the free competition sector, you find Detroit where we had manufacturing manufacturing in Detroit. Now, where is all that assets? Well, if you want to find all those assets, go look in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. There you'll see the house prices are going up, and they're hiring people, and um, people are driving expensive cars, and if you have a if you have a dealership that sells really high-end cars, I mean, you know, 300000 and up, um, you can't keep them in stock. So if you want an example, where did Detroit go? Well, go look at Washington, D.C. suburbs, and you'll find it. That's assimilation. Well, and Ed, if you look at my situation right now, I own property in Fairfax County, Virginia. I grew up in this county, and it, it used to be kind of a, a kind of, I almost want to say, a little bit of a redneckish county kind of growing up. Today, it, in tw- right. 25 years, it has shifted gears. And if you tell most Americans, hey, the highest median income in the country, is in Fairfax County, Virginia, they look at you like you're crazy. Well, hold on. You mean it's not Greenwich, Connecticut? It's not Los Angeles? It's not It's not Manhattan? No, it's Fairfax County, Virginia. See, I think if this, uh, if this podcast thing doesn't work out for you, you can always go into real estate advising. <laughs> I think your, your perspicacity is most impressive. <laughs> One other thing I went around, uh, on, when we we're talking about trend following, if you, once you uh, get to the point where you see the thing is basically going chaotic, 
and we've got bubble markets and so forth, then it, it comes right back full circle. The only way to really uh, deal with this, you have to go with the trends because they're going to be enormous trends and you might get um, a deflation based on credit implosion and then you might get a the inflation based on um, printing more money, you might get them at the same time. Um, right now, they're kind of in balance, and they have been for the last several years, so uh, you haven't had a whole lot of trends because those two forces have been in balance, and they're getting both of them are getting larger. But eventually, it's going to resolve one way or another, and the the, uh, the deflation may win in the in the short run, and then inflation in the long run. But whenever, you, it's very difficult to predict these things, so you have to go with the trends. And once you get to the point where you say, well, I don't know what's going to happen except the economy is, is, is assimilating, then, then at that point you have to say, well, I, then I have to just go with whatever trend is going. And in your case, real estate in Virginia, smart investment. You're one of the you turn out to be one of the. I guess uh, you're a, you're qualified now as a, a real estate guru because you happen to have <laughs> real estate in the very and how how you happen to have that and so forth. But that's the trend, and the, the trend has been going up for quite a while. And the trend, if you look at your house uh, over the last twenty years or thirty, and you look at a similar house at the start in Detroit, you see the Detroit house has gone down. To zero. Um, to a fraction, a small fraction was worth it. And your house has probably gone up five or ten times. So, Well, it's not – I mean, look, it's it's great for my personal situation, but I freely admit that this is a it's, – it's a, it's a terrible situation. It really is that, uh, you know, cities – and look, even cities like Las Vegas, you're seeing uh, 80% of homes underwater. Uh, you know, many, many uh, towns and cities in Arizona, Southern California. I mean, real estate has just not recovered. But then you look at this area that I'm in right now and you see – uh, standard issue suburban style homes selling for 1.5 to 1.8 million. I mean, Ed, there's nothing here. There's no water. There's no beaches. There's no mountains. There's asphalt. <laughs> That's the. Yeah, that- well, the you got in a nutshell. Or you summed up the whole the whole last part of my book, which is you basically have some mixed feelings about the, the economy going down and you happen to be on the right side of it. You're aligning yourself with uh, with assimilation and you don't like it personally and you're making money at it. So I think that's that's what basically you're already doing. You're already doing what I recommend people do is figure out a way to align with it and you seem to be an example of, yeah, the the uh, economy is assimilating, and you figure out a way to make money on it. And there is a, there's always opportunity, and you're on the, you're onto a good trend there. I don't know how long it's going to last, but you're certainly onto a good trend. And selling Detroit real estate and buying uh, Virginia real estate um, that's been <laughs> a good real estate spread. Let me get you to talk a little bit more about. Because we've talked about some somber issues, or at least some people might perceive them as somber. To me, I perceive them as like, hey, I can wrap my arms around something. But you do very clearly at the end, and we've already talked about this some, but you say, hey, look, it's going to be chaotic. Enjoy the ride. Have a good time. And you do lay out you do lay out a way to make money. You do, you do point out that a trend-following trading perspective, you point this out in Govopoly, will be your your I don't necessarily want to use the word best it might not be the word you would use but your one of your best opportunities to profit from all this unknown chaos that is sure to happen as you say as as the assimilation model moves forward yeah I, uh, yeah there's ways to do that i think you have to say like, again it's what you're doing with your uh, with your real estate you go with the trend and as things become increasingly chaotic and um, volatile, and as as the system gets to the point where there's very little left to assimilate, then you get into enormous trends. And if you find out a way to uh, align with those, you can probably do better than you can staying stuck in one asset class or trying to figure it out because you're 
I don't think there's any way of, uh, of understanding anything in chaos. When things get chaotic, there is by nature no way to understand it. So if you, if you have a, if you have a system, an investing system based on trying to understand things, particularly if you have, and I point this out as well, particularly if your system says, well, when you're wrong, the market says you're wrong on your idea, and some people double up on it. Well, you only have to be wrong once to so get wiped out on that. So you you have to find some way of following trends. I I point out some ways in the um, I point out some ways in my book to do that. I want to make I want to make it very clear. I don't have any. I don't publish any particular system in the book, and I don't promise anybody's going to make any money. This isn't by any means. This isn't a book that promises. Uh, some system to get rich on. I don't have a system in the book. I claim that you have to, you have to do your work and you have to find a system that fits yourself and so forth. So this, I don't have a, you know, magic, a magic, uh, way to get rich in there. There's nothing to do with that. And there's plenty of that out there. I don't, I'm not doing that. But I am saying that of all the strategies that you can employ, to protect yourself and perhaps prosper during these times, you have to have some degree of uh, ability to detect trends and act on them and do so with uh, appropriate risk control. You know, Ed, you do. we didn't talk about it in this interview, but you do talk about a lot of very specific issues in the book. You talk about the pros and cons of bailouts. You talk about whether or not American debts can be paid off. You talk about you get into the very, very basics of good economics, stuff like tool making. Uh, you get into issues talking about, uh, you know, the, the the government essentially is there to take care of the Gavopoli system. And and it's really just you, you break these issues down. But let me ask as a final question, is there anything that I did not address today or is there something important on your mind that you really want to leave listeners with that, you know, j- maybe it's even summing up what we've been talking about. But is there something that I missed that's near and dear to you? I'm happy that, that we couldn't exhaust the topics in the book in an interview. There's more to the book than we talked about, so that's maybe motivate people to take a look at it. I think I'd like to mention the mention the link. Um, if they want to learn more about the book, go to govopoly.com, G-O-V-O-P-O-L-Y, govopoly, like government monopoly. Look on govopoly.com, and you can see, um, you can get a, a sample of the writing and if people are interested in it. So, yeah, I would hope that uh, maybe our, our interview would motivate some people to take a little closer look at it and maybe want to read it. And, I, you know, we could go on for... Um, for for for, for, for hours, yeah. <laughs> well, I spent four I spent four years thinking about this. So yeah. there's, you know, I'm I'm a very hopeful guy for myself. I'm not hopeful for the system that you describe in your book. That system, as you describe so eloquently, will do what it wants to do and do what it's supposed to do. But I'm very hopeful for my personal situation, for my friends, my family, and I think that's the positive message that you lay out. I, I also want to mention there's about 360 pages, and I have a picture on every page. So at a thousand words per picture, that's you know, there's three hundred and sixty thousand words that you can get by. But I think that one of the last pictures in the book sums it up. And I think that the point of the book is uh, bottom line, the point of the book is share the love. If you remember that, you'll do okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's your 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 yeah. That, I'm looking at that picture right now. I'm not going to tell people what it is. They'll have to go check it out. But uh, I think you're right on with that. And uh, I always enjoy talking to you. I always I always learn something. I that's that's my definition of a of a good friend is someone that always teaches me something every time I talk to them. So I appreciate uh, appreciate your time today. Ed. Well, I learned a lot too uh, visiting with you. I appreciate the fact that you prepared yourself. You read it and you asked uh, questions that were pertinent to the uh, content. So I, I was, uh, I always enjoy talking to you and particularly enjoyed this interview. Well, thank you, Ed. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. As a little extra today, I want you to go check out YouTube and see Ed's video on the Whipsaw song. And here's a little of the music going out. You get a whip and I get a saw, honey. You get a whip and I get a saw, babe. You get a whip and I get a saw, one good 
trend pays for them all, honey trader, baby mine. Now what do we do when we catch a trend, honey? What do we do when we catch a trend, baby? Well, what do we do when we catch a trend? We ride that trend right to the end, honey trader, baby mine. So you get a whip and I'll get us all, honey. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, Protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money? Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.